I'm Dave Burkus. They call me Mr. Trend, and you're watching Eye on Business. Hello everybody, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report. And this time we're gonna talk about flexibility and coachability. As an early stage investor, the first test for me is whether my entrepreneurs are flexible and coachable, a very important thing for me to know. And I look at that, as do most angel groups, as one of the most important things we look for when we invest in a new company. Doctoral theses have been written on these subjects, so it's not small at all, and Often, these things come up to nor near or toward the top. In my book, Extending the Runway, I explore that there are five basic types of resources that people must know and use to be able to be successful in business. And these, I think you'd like to look at, are time and money, of course, and process and relationships and context, those five things. In my book, we talk about how this works with somebody who is either flexible or coachable. Flexibility is the context in which a business envisions uh, the marketplace constantly changing as new products come and as people try and adopt to the way the marketplace changes as well. A plan written last month may not even last for a full month based upon all the changes in the marketplace and all the things that can happen. Everything seems to happen faster these days, especially in the world of technology, where you might guess things happen so fast that plans have to be rewritten all the time. One of the most or best indicators of future success for an entrepreneur at an early stage is the idea or quality of idea of the relationships that they can find with veterans who are people who know, who have done this before, who understand that there are many times in which the veteran understands how to get a business going and how to make things happen faster and cheaper. And finally, there are ways to improve the process of design, of tests, of rollout, of making new ideas happen. And many of these potential coaches that we're talking about out there have made their own mistakes on their money or somebody else's money, but not yours. And they can therefore help you to coach your way into earlier success using those five things we've just talked about, time, money, process, relationships, and context. There are always ways to improve. I've seen entrepreneurs go through the complete process of raising money for a business from investors, many of whom were experienced well beyond what just friends and family would add to a company, only to ignore all of that advice and execute a flawed business plan to death. Ignoring the pleas and attempts of coaches and others, including those very investors who have as much to lose as the entrepreneurs. Well, my wish to you is don't be one of those. Don't exercise a flawed plan to death, whatever you do. Well, these come from my books, Burkonomics, are available on the Amazon store and other places as well. But what I can wish for you is success in your business, or if you're an investor, success in your investing. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. Well, hello everybody. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. It's a pleasure to bring to you every time we talk a chance to look at various aspects of technology and for entrepreneurs and for investors alike, what that technology will do in the future. In fact, that's our subject today. Will tech kill your job? This may relate to you or to your employees or to your offspring or even their offspring, but let's find out what that means as it relates to the very issue at hand. I think we're approaching the age of the thinking machine and what that means for us is 
we have so many changes that have happened during the last five to six years that will be multiplied many fold during the next five or six. We have to ask the question, stop me if you've heard this story before. Have you been involved in the telephone industry, the communications industry, the computer industry, the record industry, or many of the others that are shown here on the screen? Many of the people in that industry have said, it'll never happen to me. So stop me if you've heard the story before. I think that things have changed so fast that we need to go back and look for a few seconds at the past to get a feeling for the future. In 1995, 35 million people used the internet. That was less than 1%. And only 1% of the world's population had mobile phones at that time. And none of those people could access the internet using a mobile phone. Well, by 2024, 90% of the global population will have regular internet access. And to me, what that means is we will have a completely different environment when we have this massive change than we had last time. In fact, let's call it the new industrial revolution, where robotics and additive manufacturing, which means 3D printing, really take over many of the tasks that we've had in the past. Here are some numbers that might be interesting to you. 50%. That's the approximate share of manufacturing tasks that robots will likely perform by the year 2025, up from just 10% today. Well, since 1999, U.S. manufacturing, the workforce is down 28%. The U.S. has lost 54,000 manufacturing businesses, not jobs, but companies, since 1999. Well, in 1979, it took 19.5 million Americans who had manufacturing jobs that 19.5 by 1983 was down to 16.7 million. And by 2024, this time when I think we're going to have a massive change that will be very obvious to all, just 7.1% of U.S. jobs will be in manufacturing. A gigantic number, which means the manufacturing industries in general are going to lose lots and lots of jobs. In 1980, 25 jobs produced $1 million in manufacturing output. Look at that today in, 19, in 2017. It takes only 6.5 jobs to do the very same thing today. In 2015, 132,000 jobs were added in just 3D printing and robotics alone. So we know that there are jobs being created as some of these jobs are being taken away as well. Today, robots perform about 10% of all manufacturing jobs. But by 2025, this period that I'm talking about being that very big time of change, a quarter of all manufacturing jobs will be produced by robots. And you're going to see things that you never have seen before. This I know is a mock-up, but here is a bridge being built by a robot. And here is a home being built by a robot using cement as the wall structure. Actually, I have a nephew today that is doing something like this in the Gulf states and doing it already using more manual processes, but just the same. Now you might wonder about the manufacturing process, and yes, you're right, Amazon is responsible for much of this change. And in fact, Amazon at this point has added 145,000 new jobs in the last several years, but it has displaced 294,000 jobs, meaning a net loss of 148,000 jobs just to Amazon. Do you think this is going to continue? Yes, it will. But you know, part of this is a problem that comes because of our educational environment. So here's a number for you, 94%. That's the growth in jobs between 1980 and 2016 that have required higher levels of analytical and social skills than jobs from time before. So you might wonder what that means when you compare how the seniors of this last year, 2016's graduating class, compared to what the companies have asked for, for employees. So let's look at just two of those. Number one, in business and accounting, 81% of the companies are looking for students who graduate in business and accounting. But look, only 19.2% of the students in college today have selected that as a major. Worse yet, computer sciences, companies are looking, 64% of the companies are looking for people in computer science. And yet only 3.1% of graduates in this senior class from the last year, 2016, happen to major in computer sciences. Here's a number for you, 88%. This is the share of U.S. manufacturing jobs lost to increase productivity and automation just between the years 2000 and 2010. So let's look a little further. 
I think that five million jobs will be lost in these next five years as we come to this transition period that I'm describing, and only two million new jobs will be created in robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and additive manufacturing. And by the way, some of these jobs will come in biotech and genetics as well. So there will be increases of jobs, but as you're beginning to see, they may not match the losses in these various fields. So it was Arthur Clarke who said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And because this is so important, in my next presentation, I'm going to delve into what happens after this time of creative destruction around 2024 and 2025, and we will look closely at the jobs that will be created and the kinds of jobs that will be destroyed. I hope you'll be for me or be with me during that time so that we have a chance to do just that. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report with Eye on Business. Hello everybody, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. Today we're going to delve into part two of Will Tech Kill Your Job? as we talk about how this is getting us into the age of the thinking machine. If you saw part one before, we talked about how jobs are being destroyed in a process of creative destruction during this period that now is a transition period between one age and another. And these ages that we're talking about began in 1971 and today we're beginning to see the result of all of this. I think that about uh, every 55 years there's a change in the way technology has been treated with all kinds of new things coming at each time. And that we're currently in the fifth wave. And in that fifth wave, which began in the 1970s, we redefined all of those things we've thought about during our lifetimes. Medicine, computing, materials, transportation, defense, and geopolitics. But now we look at the sixth wave which I believe will begin in the, 19, in the 2020s and go through the 2080s. Lots of jobs that were available during this last fifth wave are not going to be available in the sixth. It's going to affect everybody on the planet. There will be more changes, I believe, in the next 20 years than in the past 2,000 years. And I think we're going to learn that artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics will come of age and create many of these changes we're talking about. So let's call this new wave that will begin in the early middle portion of the 2020s, the wave of the thinking machine. Think first about Siri and Cortana and Hey Google and Alexa. Well, those were early experiments in machine learning. And it took us from very small nanobots into very large, IBM Watson being a good example. And we are today looking at this future as the wave of the thinking machine. But let's talk for a second and see what it looks like where we are today. So look first at when you make a query of Google, you'll be surprised that 68% of the time Google responds correctly to the questions that you ask. But if you look at Alexa today, which is very much uh, younger than a Google and has less data to go by, only 20.7% of the questions that are asked are answered at all, even though most of those are answered accurately. That's a long way away from machine learning being able to answer accurately all of those kinds of questions that we're going to be thinking we ask. Think of audio artificial intelligence as the new electricity. In 1890, people worked only by daylight and gaslight. And by 1908, when we had electricity for the first time, people were able to work in multiple shifts and have increased output. And what it did was to create many new jobs, thinking of lamp makers, power pole makers, copper wire makers, lots of people that had jobs that didn't exist just before that point in time. Well, by 2017, we're seeing increases in throughput in areas, new jobs being created, in smart farming, in medical robotic workers, in human machine interface workers, AI programmers, in areas we've never thought of before. So here comes a statistic that might be interesting in this next generation that we see coming in the middle 2020s, 38%. That's the number of U.S. jobs that are at risk of automation by the 2030s. 38% of all U.S. jobs, not just manufacturing. Well, here's another number for you, 47%. That's the portion of U.S. jobs that could be computerized within this next two decades. So where are the jobs that are most at risk? 
Well, it turns out in the manufacturing sector, 78% of the jobs of predictable physical work are at risk to be replaced by artificial intelligence and by robotics. And in the unpredictable work, such as construction workers and forestry workers, and even those who raise outdoor animals, 25% of those jobs are at risk during this time with artificial intelligence. So what are the top jobs of the future? Well, drone applications make some sense, augmented virtual reality, 3D printing and design, healthcare, information technology, alternative energy, I can go on forever, creation of new content, robotics, cybersecurity, computer game design, and biometrics. But only two of those jobs look like jobs from this past or fifth wave between now and the early 2020s. And they are information technology and content creation. So the first jobs to be lost to automation during this next change that we're going to see are jobs in middle management, which will be changed into jobs for artificial intelligent beings. Commodity salespeople will be gone. And report writers, journalists, and announcers surprisingly will be gone because this next generation won't want to stop and listen to television to get their news. And maybe you'd be surprised, accountants and bookkeepers will be gone because blockchain and other technologies will replace the need for many of the kinds of accounting that we do. Another surprise might be that doctors will be less than today as far as the numbers, or at least in percentages of the population, because of AI and other forms of being able to diagnose and to treat. Well, the last jobs lost to automation are just as interesting as the first jobs. Preschool teachers, elementary school teachers, we're going to need more of those for sure because we're not willing to trust those kinds of jobs to automation. And because we want to, professional athletes will certainly remain during that time. And you may boo me, but politicians are going to be necessary during that time as well, as well as judges. Mental health professionals, because as we now know, the young generation is using and needing much more mental health help medically than in past generations. And then of course, coaches, advisors, uh, nurturers, motivators, all of these kinds of people to treat those of us who have more time and have more need than those in previous generations. And boy, this is just in time because you might worry about the aging population. 10,000 people retire today every single day. And that's 15% of the world's population today is retired. You want to guess what that'll be by the year 2060? The answer is 60% of the world's population, more than half of the world's population will be retired. And what? Automation will be a blessing in disguise because at that point, we're going to need people to work and machines to help those people to work as well. And what will tech entrepreneurs do and be able to do during this time that we should be interested in and encourage? Well, we believe tech entrepreneurs will be working hard to eradicate disease and equal access, access to the internet and to clean water and to education. Tech workers, tech entrepreneurs will be working for climate change to help eliminate obesity and of course to help eliminate accidental deaths. It's one of the reasons why self-automating or self-driving cars are important today because it's one of the chief causes of accidental deaths. Industries that are in most need of tech innovation include healthcare, way behind many other industries, education, very manually operated today, and construction. And so it turns out that together, those three account for 88% of all of the cost or price inflation today. If we could eliminate or reduce that, much of our inflation pressure will be gone and much more of technology will be useful for us. So artificial intelligence, which we're going to call artificial general intelligence rather than very specific intelligence of today, is going to be self-aware, will be creative, will have a consciousness, think about that for a minute, and be able to experience subjective experiences and sensations. That's artificial general intelligence. It doesn't create, it isn't available today. It will come during this next 50 years, I'm sure. And it will lead to something even more. It will lead to machines that are conscious entities, machines that can taste wine or see the beauty of a sunset or the pain of a toothache. And for me, that means these machines are capable of creating something even beyond. At that point in time, sometime late in the next 50 year cycle, you're going to see this kind of artificial super machines 
machines that actually allow us to seed more of life's decisions. And that becomes the real question for us. Elon Musk and others have asked us this question before, and I think we have to ask it of ourselves. Can we create an ethical robot? There have been a lot of movies that have talked about that. Does AGI pose a threat to humans? There have been a lot of people who have warned us that they do. But then again, as we finish this little short impact, talking about the 50 years to come, we have to remember Yogi Berra, who said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So this is Dave Burkus. Here I am about the Burkus Report. And what we've done today is to try and talk in these last two episodes about how jobs will change dramatically between the time that we are looking at today and the time we'll look at in the next 50 or 55 year cycle. I hope you've begun to think about where you'll fit during that time and how perhaps you'll be able to take advantage of all of these changes we're about to see. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. Well, hello, everybody. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. And today we're going to talk about what I think to be an important subject, and that is protecting your trade secrets and your company lists. You know, most senior and middle managers will understand when a subordinate comes to you and says they're going to leave or resign to start a new business. But all of us are going to immediately question whether the new business is going to compete in any way with the business that we hold and react accordingly, depending on what the person says. Even more suspicious is the action of an entrepreneur or an employee who resigns suddenly without notice or resignation. It's natural to worry over whether that person is off on a journey to a competitor. If the employee who's about to resign tells you that he or she is off to conquer the world in a completely different business or a new arena, there's almost always the unspoken sigh of relief and a cooperative attitude that flows from that point on in the conversation. But if the departing employee is even a little bit reticent to tell you of his or her plans, the result is the first stage of what could become an outright war between you and this newly separated past employee, which I am sure you will send away with an escort out the door. You can expect to have the same attitude if a past employee later resurfaces from a layoff or a resignation, or being fired, with a plan for a competitive business. Or if an employee tells you that he's going to a competitor. Most employers have with their employees signed non-disclosure agreements and trade secret agreements and whatever else to protect those trade secrets. But many states recognize the right for former employees to work even if in direct competition with a past employer. But that right clearly stops when the employee or past employee uses a customer list or any trade secret from the past employer. Anyone can be sued, you know, even if without merit. And responding to a suit can be traumatic in so many ways, from expenditure of your time, your cash, emotional drain from the worry over an outcome, to loss of industry goodwill by that entrepreneur perceived to be stepping over the line. Well, this is especially true for someone who has sold his business or her business only to surface later to compete in one way or another with the buyer. Never underestimate the venomous response from such a threat. So here's my advice to you to give to departing employees. No matter what the circumstance, never ever be guilty of using trade secrets or ideas from your past employer, especially customer lists. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business.